Hi folks, welcome to this video on sports injuries risk factors, okay? So we're going to look at some of the most common risk factors for injuries and this is going to build to ultimately how we can prevent certain injuries taking place. Now what we have on this slide are what are termed intrinsic risk factors, okay? So we have got previous or past injuries as a potential risk factor. So it's common sense, you do not continue to train or continue to compete on an injury because if you're an injured area, if you're part of your body, you're going to have a loss of strength, decreased range of movement, and that is only going to increase your injury risk further. So never play on an injury. Your posture and alignment. Now, all us human beings have slight variations. We all have one limb that's slightly longer than the other in terms of arms and legs, generally as a rule. We've all got a certain curvature of the spine that is slightly different to everyone else. Now, all of these posture and alignment factors can also either increase or decrease our injury risk. If you've got someone, for example, who's got really exaggerated curve of the spine, they're likely to get lots of hamstring problems, likely to get lots of low back pain. Whereas someone who's got a normal curvature of the spine will have reduced risk of hamstring strains and will have reduced risk of lower back pain. So posture and alignment is also an intrinsic risk factor. Nutrition is also one. If I eat a diet that is low in carbohydrates, I lack energy. That lack of energy is going to increase my injury risk. Because if I'm fatigued, I'm more likely to make a mistake. If I make a mistake, I'm more likely to get injured. Equally, if I've got a diet that's lacking in protein, I'm going to have inadequate muscle growth and repair. So again, diet can play a big part in terms of our injury risk factors. And finally, training. Training should follow the principles of training. If it does, I am adequately prepared for my sporting situation, my sporting environment. If I do not follow the principles of training, I am not going to be fit for my activity and therefore I'm going to increase my risk of uh, getting an injury. So you could ask the question, what are the intrinsic risk factors for sporting injuries? Now, my way of remembering it is remembering a pint. Intrinsic risk factors, everyone wants a pint inside them if you're that way inclined. So a pint stands for P, posture and alignment. I, injuries, are they playing or competing whilst already injured? N, nutrition, are they eating adequate carbs and protein? T, training, are they following the principles of training? So any questions on intrinsic risk factors around injuries, think of the word pint, P-I-N-T, and that will give you four marks to talk about and expand upon. So in terms of extrinsic risk factors, unfortunately, try as I might, I couldn't get up with a way to remember this. These are ones you're just going to have to remember, unfortunately. But extrinsic risk facts in terms of injury, coaches play a big part in that. Coaching correct technique minimises injury. Coaching incorrect technique is going to maximise injury. So, you know, making sure you've got access to good coaching and good coaches. Rule changes that are brought in, you know, sports are constantly adapting rules. Some of the rules are about fairness and equality. Some of them are about reducing harm. So, you know, in terms of football, you can't go both feet off the ground to a tackle now, quite rightly so. That's there to minimise the risk of injury. Not taking a player past the horizontal position in rugby, so not picking them up off the ground, then jumping them with the head below the hips onto the ground. So those rule changes have been brought in to minimise uh, risk of certain types of injuries. The new uh, sequence, uh, scrummage sequence in rugby union has been brought in to minimise injury risk in that particular aspect of the game. Sad fact is age. As we age, we become more susceptible to injuries and the slower uh, we recover from them as well. Um, protective equipment, so wearing the correct protective equipment, gum shields, shin pads, that minimises injury risk. And also footwear, blades, studs, spikes, etc. They give us good grip, give us good traction. We're less likely to fall. If we're less likely to fall, we're less likely to put a hand out and therefore dislocate our wrist, our shoulder hit our head and get a concussion injury, things like that. So these are all extrinsic risk factors associated with injuries. Now, warming up and cooling down obviously play a big part in minimising our injury risk, but we've got to do them properly uh, to make sure that we do minimise the chance of getting injured. Now, a warm-up increases the range of movement around the joints. That's going to make your muscle tissue, ligament and uh, tendon tissue more elastic, able to stretch more, and therefore it reduces the risk of injuries such as sprains and strains. So there's a really important reason to warm up to increase that temperature in, in those soft tissues. 
If human body temperature increases, that's going to get more oxygen diffusion into the blood and into the muscles. If I've got more oxygen in my tissues, I'm going to have reduced fatigue. If I've got reduced fatigue, I've got a lower injury risk as well. So that's not as obvious a one, but it is definitely a factor as to why we need to warm up and how it can minimise our injury risk. And finally, don't forget, a warm-up should allow us to mentally prepare. It should allow us to work on our decision-making, speed up our reaction times. If our decision-making is at good speed, if we're reacting quickly, again, we're less likely to get injured in a competitive environment. So warming up, like I said, we need to do it properly if we're going to reduce the risk of getting injured. So general rules. Warm-up should last around about 30 minutes. Anything less than that, we're not doing it properly. We're not doing it for long enough, sorry. The intensity needs to gradually build. It shouldn't just be straight in high intensity straight away. And each one should consist of three stages. So stage number one, as it says here, and this allows us to build the intensity, is a pulse raiser. Light aerobic activity, large body movements, engage all major joints and muscles. So you know, you're jogging, your high knees, your high heels, your side steps. Uh, those kind of activities are really, really important in part of your pulse raiser. Once we've done that for about 10 minutes or so, we then get onto the stretching side of things. So stretching again increases the range of movement, it improves technique, reduces strain on major muscles, and it should mainly be dynamic stretching. I'm going to deal with that separately in a second. But dynamic stretching, movement stretching. You know, one of the reasons is you've just spent 10 minutes getting everything elevated, heart rate, blood pressure, blood flow, oxygen delivery, and then stand still and do static stretching is going to undo a lot of that hard work. And then finally, stage three, sport specific drills. This is that mental engagement now. So hitting the tennis ball, if you are a tennis player, getting your decision making and your reaction times up to speed, recreate things at actual pace, engage the body as well as the brain. They're the three stages that we need to do as part of a well-structured warm up. So dynamic flexibility then is absolutely essential in a warm up. Remember, dynamic flexibility is sport specific or more sport specific than static stretching. Very rare in sport, you stand still and hold that end of range for a period of time. Um, the vast majority of sports, you take that limb to end of range and you bring it back very, very quickly. You know, when you're kicking, throwing, punching, tackling, things like that. They're the kind of actions where you get to end of range and then bring that limb back very quickly. Static flexibility is also shown to not reduce injury risk. The static flexibility has no positive effect on reducing injury risk, no effect whatsoever. And actually, a lot of studies are now showing that static flexibility can reduce power and strength by up to 10%. But if you go into your sport 10% down on power and strength, chances are you're going to get injured because you're going to get outdone by someone in the tackle or in the block or something like that. So, you know, always do dynamic stretching of a warm-up and never do static stretching as part of a warm-up. So finally then a cool down. Why do we need to do a cool down? Well by doing an effective cool down we reduce stiffness in muscles, ligaments and tendons. That's what this board represents here, being stiff as a board. This is due to reduction in tension as the muscles are cooled down more effectively. So again the muscle is less, remember pro athletes train four or five days a week and they'll have a competition day in, in, in there as well. So if I am less tense the following day, I'm less likely to pick up an injury. So reducing tension is really important. Doing a cool down ensures that blood does not cool in the blood vessels, which is what this image represents here. But instead, the blood remains circulating through our system. If that blood pools, that blood is full of toxins, CO2, lactic acid, things like that. Doesn't make the muscles feel great. It can create stiffness and soreness in the muscles again reducing our range of movement and again increasing our injury risk. And linked to that, as we mentioned, lactic acid, major cause of DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. So cool down helps buffer the lactic acid away from uh, the following, uh, away from the muscles following sport and activity. So again, less pain, less soreness, the muscles feel fresh air. You're going to make better actions the following day if you are training the next day and you're less likely to get injured again. So cool down is just as important as a warm up when it comes to reducing injury risk. So finally then doing a proper cool down, general rules. Again, a cool down should be 20 to 30 minutes long and not, not enough of us do that adequately. Uh, this time we've got to gradually decrease the intensity of the cool down. And it, this one generally consists of two stages. 
So stage one, as I've written here, light aerobic activity, jogging, swimming, cycling, rowing, etc. That's going to increase oxygen levels in the blood and delivery to the muscles. And it will also allow some toxins such as lactic acid and CO2 to be flushed out of the blood and muscles. So light aerobic activity, light bits of jogging after you've finished sports or training, that's going to increase oxygen flow to the muscles and increase the removal of CO2 and lactic acid from the muscles. And then finally, stage two, stretching to reduce muscle tension in all the major muscle groups used during physical activity. This is why static stretching is fine. Do static stretching as part of a cool down. It doesn't matter if you're reducing power and strength after you've finished playing sports. But other forms of stretching that are frequently done as part of a cool down are PNF stretches. So if you need to recap on what PNF is, remember there's a video to do with flexibility and the types of flexibility training. That's all in there as well. The major thing we are trying to do with this cool down is to get rid or prevent GOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. It's often caused by micro tears in the muscles following a heavy training session, following a competitive experience. You'll have damaged the muscle fibres, they'll have torn a little bit. Remember, that's fine, that's normal. They will then repair a little bit stronger over the next two to three days. Um, but it really happens in you know activities where you've done lots of heavy impact, lots of high resistance, strength training, plyometrics, things like that. But not only is it the micro tears, it's the lactic acid levels that are built in the muscles. Again, these two things combined create pain and source and tenderness. So a good cool down is going to reduce the effect of DOMS, make you feel fresh yet sooner, and then increase the quality of training that you do after that, and therefore reduce the injury risk. Okay, so these are the risk factors surrounding injuries and how we can start to minimize the risk factors. Hope you found this video useful, folks.